so in today's lesson, God's going to reveal uh, how our destiny defines us, how it defines us and determines our outlook in life. And so God wants to, God wants to put a different set of glasses on us as believers so that we're understanding and we begin to look at life through a biblical worldview, a biblical transformed view of what the world looks like. So we're looking at it through the lens of God, of what God has revealed to us. So we're going to look at these two points. In Christ, every believer wins. They're accepted by God in a sin-cursed world, assured of heaven, and of God judging all sin. Number two, Christ will return to claim his children as pictured in the life of Enoch. So number one, in Christ, every believer wins. They're accepted by God in a sin-cursed world, assured of heaven, and God judging all sin. So take your Bibles, and let's go to Genesis chapter 4 and verses 6 to 8. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Okay, so why did God plead with Cain? Like think about this, at this, at this point of juncture, here's, here's Cain. What did Cain, what had Cain just done? Yeah, made an offering that God did not accept. Okay, so he's standing in defiance. So why is God talking to him? Yeah, he's giving opportunity to repent. God desires that relationship, doesn't he? He desires that he would repent as, as Abel did. So now did, did Cain heed God's warning? No, what did he do? He allowed anger to continue and to grow. And what did he do as a result? Struck down his brother, didn't he? In, in murder. So Abel's death didn't take God's, God by surprise. In fact, as we look from the text here, God had warned Cain of the potential of where his sin would go. But what was interesting, as you look at this text, there's no warning for Abel. Hey, Abel, hang on, say, Abel, be careful. There's, there's a possible imminent death coming. Hey, be careful. Is there any warning for Abel in this passage of Scripture? Hang on, I thought Abel was the one that was accepted here. Shouldn't he get some, and some extra attention by God? I thought um, he should have some more rights and privileges. Why is the one who's standing in defiance getting all the attention? Like you look at that, so here's Abel, he gets one little mention in verse, uh, uh, verse 4 and 5, and then 6 through 8 and going forward, it's Cain, 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 Cain. Where's Abel? Let's go through, let's go through God's word and see, and, and see what this comes through. Let's read verses 9 to 11 of chapter 4. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So did Cain remain unpunished for his sin? He was cursed, yes. But even back up, even back up that, I mean, how, is, how, is, how is the sin dealt with? How did God deal with the sin? Didn't God question him? Think about this. What would that dialogue have, have sounded like? So here's Cain standing in defiance, has killed his brother, and now he's talking with who? With God. What do you think that conversation sounded like? And so God even questioning him was the beginnings of that, beginnings of that judgment as he was as laying out. God gave him, believe it or not, gave him another opportunity to repent. He then judged him for killing Abel and put a curse on him, and God's curse was no light matter either. Now, typically, in our North American culture, we don't understand those concepts of curses. But if you go to another country amongst the Mangan, they understand what a curse is because your whole life is lived in complete fear. And so when God placed a curse upon Cain here, it was his active hand against him for the rest of his life. Like, that was intense, wasn't it? So then why did God just merely put a curse on him and didn't squash him down and just didn't strike him down instantly? Why would God go to that deal and put a curse and not uh, deal with him and um, strike him down instantly? Give him another chance. Why? In his love, he was desiring that Cain would repent. See, in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, it says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God desired that he would repent, and God knew what awaited Cain should he die in his sin. What awaited him if he should die in his sin? An excruciating, eternal torment separated from God forever. And we've got to see, as God works for in light of eternity, we've got to see that Cain's defiance not only cost him needless torment in this life, it cost him that ongoing torment, the like of fire, but it also turned all of his offspring against God as well, didn't it? All of his offspring died horribly in the flood. That was never God's desire. It was never his intention in creating him. 
So let's dig into this. When the world looks at Abel's death, do they define it as a win or a loss? A loss. Why? Yeah, because his life on earth is over. Everything, and for the world, everything they have is based in this world. And you know what? something? I'll bet you every last one of us, when we look at, at Abel's death, are going, ah, uh, that's not fair. Because we too, if we were honest, we see it almost as a loss as well. But God's perspective is completely different. Death or no death, how did Abel ultimately win? He belonged to God, didn't he? He knew he was accepted. That gave him what? What, what? Again, we don't know time frames of this Genesis account. We don't know how long or how old Abel was at this point in time. We don't know how long he lived from this sacrifice. We don't know any of that scope. But think about that. He knew he was accepted by God and allowed him to walk through the brokenness of what that world looked like. He, that was a win. How else did, how else did, how else did Abel win? He was, he was assured of heaven. That was also there in front of him. He won. Death, death or no death. And then lastly, he was also assured of God judging sin. God had his back. God would right all wrongs against him. Abel, did he not win? Absolutely he won. Now it seems shocking to us that God would allow the death of Abel. God was not heartless here. And we need to understand that. God was not heartless. He felt Cain's blow as much as Abel did. We need to understand and remember that Abel was created in God's image. Abel reflected God. And so when Cain struck Abel down, Cain struck God himself. God took that blow personally, and, God, and that's how God dealt with it before, before Cain. He judged him accordingly. Think about this. God allowed Abel's death because God had a bigger, had a bigger plan than just Abel's security in this sin-cursed world. He was seeking to rescue Cain as well. And we've got to see this from God's perspective. God knew that this little blip of time on this earth is not our true destiny, but rather in heaven and that eternal, ongoing intimacy. And so God works from that eternal perspective. God knew that Abel was forever safe. There was no more sin. There was no more sickness. There was no more death. There was no more evil. Abel was safe. And we've got to see that. God allows the free choice of every man, woman, a child, even when it affects another person. We are not robots. And we've got to understand that. Too often we focus on the murder of Abel and miss the bigger picture. Abel was already safe. God was trying to protect Cain from eternal, eternal torment. So think about this. How many years has Cain been in this lake of fire already? How many matches would I need to dump out to represent the years that Cain has been in the lake of fire? If one match was one year, how many, how, many match, how many years has, has Cain been in that, ex, that, that excruciating torment? Yeah, six to 8,000 years. And how many more years does he have to go? How many forevers is there, in, is, is there in forever? You see, God's intention was for eternity. He was seeking to save Cain from that which was to come. And we've got to look at it from that perspective. God works with eternity in mind. And to make sure that we see God's perspective on death for his children, let's turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 8. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, grown, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Okay, so what is God referring to by the destruction of this earthly tent? It's this physical body, right? And so what confidence does every believer have? Based on these verses, what's our confidence? Yes. So and notice, notice the words that he uses. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have, how's it go? We have a building from God and eternal. That is the confidence of every believer, every believer in Jesus Christ. The moment of death, we are ushered into the presence of God forever. We are, think about this, we are forever home. No longer in this sin-cursed world. And is God not a parent similar to us? Think about that. If our kids go off to college for a long time, can't we wait for the day that they would come home, that we can welcome them back into embrace, to wipe away any tears, to, to hear their stories, and to just shower them with love? As the believer steps from this life into the next, is that not God's heart? 
Is his arms not open wide to receive his own children and to receive them into his embrace, to wipe away their tears? Think about that to bring ultimate healing. You see, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to put on a different set of glasses. Let me illustrate. There's a, there's a saying or there's a, an, um, an experiment that's been done. If you take a pair, a pair of reversing glasses and you put them on, everything is turned upside down. What the ceiling is now down and the floor is up. And so what I'm telling, can you imagine what it would be like to put on these reversing glasses 24-7 for, for a time? What would it be like to kind of wear those reversing glasses? Wouldn't you bash into everything as you're trying to reorientate it? But I'm told the scientists tell us that after a week, your brain, your brain completely does a reversal. Your brain, your brain will flip the upside down images, upside right. Our brain has been officially reprogrammed to see everything upside, upside down. So can you imagine the fun when you take the glasses off and you have to reprogram the brain one more time? Think about that. In many ways, mankind has been wearing these reversing glasses, and our brains have been trained to see the opposite of, opposite of God's original design. The reality is that Satan put a pair of reversing glasses on Adam and Eve when they chose to defy God, and we as mankind have been wearing those reversing glasses all this time. But at the moment of the believer's rescue, God takes off those reversing glasses off the believer so we can see everything right side up as God designed it. God's design is true reality. Amen? And so what God was wanting to do for us as believers in Jesus Christ is to reorientate us to what true reality is so that we're going to begin to see everything from his perspective, from a biblical perspective, because he, designs, he, de- he defines reality. Think about this. Satan's lied to us in, the, in telling us that we're independent and free, but the reality is that Satan is controlling us and leading us to the lake of fire. Do you see, we've got a pair of reversing glasses on it and it's completely confused. Satan lied to us that we're lords of our own destiny doing what we want, but the reality is that God is sovereign and he's the source of life. There's our reversing glasses that Satan's put on us. Uh, Satan's lied to us that God is distant and uncaring, but the reality is that God loves us and is pursuing us. Satan lied to us that the world is all we have, so we eat, drink, and be merry. But the reality is, is that we all live for eternity, either heaven or the lake of fire. And the spirits do not hold ultimate power as Satan has lied to us either. The reality is they're just pawns of Satan. And uh, the truth is that they're nothing in comparison to God. Do you see how the world looks at everything upside down? And God in his grace and his mercy has taken off those reversing glasses that through his word he's beginning to reveal everything is upside right. When for so long we've been looking at things upside down. And we need to allow God in his grace and his mercy to continue to change our perspective as we study his word so we see things from his perspective. Isn't God good? So what does this mean for a believer? So as a believer, how do we win in Christ? The assurance of? The assurance of salvation. The assurance that we have been accepted. We have the assurance that as we walk through life that we have a God who is for us. He's not against us. We have that assurance as we go forward, as he's leading us to abundance. As we looked earlier in, in, the, in the Jeremiah passage, that's incredible. That's a win, isn't it? How else have we as believers won? Can we not rise above the junk of this evil world? Are we not overcomers in Christ? Do we not have, um, do we not have that hope that this sin-cursed world is not our final home? That God is taking us to a, a place greater where there is no evil, there is no brokenness, there is no more death? And then think about this here. Who has your back? At every moment of every day, who has your back? God does. And just as God took Abel's murder personally, so too we have a God who takes everything done against us in that same personal way because we were created in his image and we are his children. He will right every wrong. Is that not a win? So then how do we as believers respond to this evil, to the sin, to the sin and the evil around us? Because we're walking in a world that's broken and evil. Think of, think of Abel. He was struck down and murdered. The reality is it happens all around us too. We have a God who has our back actively. That means that we can hold life with an open hand, knowing that God is still at work. Even if I don't see it, we have a God who is for us, and he's got our back, and he's moving his purpose and his plans forward. That gives us a confidence, doesn't it? 
But we also have to be careful that we don't get this defeatist mentality. Okay, God's win. Okay, I've won. I just got to soak up all the evil and soak up all the brokenness. No, God has said we don't have to take this um, defeatist, um, uh, beat-up mentality. No, we need to protect ourselves and protect those that, 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 um, that we love as well. We have the assurance that nothing can separate us, regardless of what comes to us, Right? And God wants us to take our eyes off of, this, of things of this earth and lift our eyes up to, to where we actually exist and, and where we truly live. And that helps us to see that. But here's another thing that God wants us to understand, how he wants us to respond. He wants us to respond with grace. Why? Why would God want us as believers to respond with grace to the evil and the sin around us? Why would he want us to respond with grace? because he did yes absolutely think about that we may struggle with god's grace towards sinners especially those who abuse us but think about it if god had judged us on the spot for our sin where would we be today did god not pour out a super amount of grace for us and our sin in our brokenness and as a result of his grace what did we come to realize Christ, there was hope and redemption. And so too, God desires that we as believers would extend grace to those who abuse us so that, we, so that God has the opportunity to also draw them towards life as well. And so God loves the abusers and longs, for, longs to rescue them. God, we need to look at these things through God's perspective. But here's another illustration to help us to understand as believers in Jesus Christ. I love this particular story. Listen to this. There was an old country doctor who would take his dog along with him when visiting patients. The dog would remain outside while the doctor went in on the, for the house call. On one occasion, the physician went to the home of a man with a terminal illness who didn't have much time to live. And as the doctor went in, the man confessed his fears to the doctor about dying and said to the doctor, Doctor, what is it like when you die? The doctor thought for a moment, and then he got up and opened the front door. His dog, who had been waiting patiently on the door, gleefully bounded in to join his, join his master. The doctor turned to the terminal sick man and said, Do you see this dog? He had no idea it was on this side of the door. All he knew was his master was there, and he wanted to be with him. That's how I feel about death, the physician continued. I'm not totally sure about the other side of that door, but I know who is there, and that's enough for me. I'm looking forward to being with my master. So as a believer in Jesus Christ... Death is no longer something to be feared because we're going home to our master and we're going home to the one who loves us. The moment we die, we see our master and Lord. Death is not the doorway to heaven, Christ is, but it is there in heaven that we're now in the arms of Christ forever and forever. We are safe forever in the arms of our master and our Lord. Isn't God good? I'm so thankful that in Christ every believer wins. Isn't that true? We can go forward with confidence and hope as we confront everything. Number two, Christ will return to claim his children as pictured in the life of Enoch. So let's, let's go over to, um, jump over to Adam's great-great-grandson Enoch. And, and we have it kind of pictured here. So here's Adam. We're going to jump way down here to, to, to Enoch about four or five generations later. So let's go to Genesis chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. Okay, so what does God tell us about Enoch from these verses? Yeah, he walked with God. How long? How long did he walk with God? Well, not quite. That's not what it says there. Sorry to excuse, to kind of beg to agree. How many years did he walk with it? He lived a total of 365 years. How long did he walk with God? 300 years, okay? What else does it say about Enoch? Yeah, he didn't die. He walked from this life, this life into the, this life into the next one, didn't he? And uh, um, that was, that's, what he, that's what he faced. So God describes Enoch as having walked with him and where his whole focus was on his relationship with Christ. Now think about this. This is not the first reference that we have of a man walking with God. What's the first reference that we have in God's word of a man walking with God? Yeah, Adam. It says in Genesis chapter 3 that God walked with him in the cool of the day. What do you think that was like? 
Wasn't that, doesn't that speak of intimacy and, and, and unity and harmony as that walk and that relationship? And so as God uses the very intimate terms in his relationship with his children. Now let's connect the important truth of Enoch being taken in this life with the last words of Christ as he ascended to heaven. To see that, we've got to go back. We've got to go over to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Okay, so Jesus' ascension, what did God promise would take place? This same Jesus. Now notice, notice the words, notice the words that he uses there. This same Jesus who was taken from you in the same way as you see him. He will come in the same way that you've seen him go. Now notice, God doesn't make any time frames, does he? He doesn't say when, doesn't say when this is going to happen. It's in the same manner. All we have is the same Jesus, so it's going to be the exact same one that, that was here, that went. He's the one that's going to come back, and he's going to come back in the same manner in which he did. Later in God's word, God begins to lay out what that's going to look like, and I've written out on the board, just for the sake of time here, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, through to chapter 5 verse 3. This is what it says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a, with a loud command, with the trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as a labor of pain on a pregnant woman and they will not escape so what what descriptions does god use to describe what this return will be like so in acts chapter one he's going to come now in first thessalonians he begins to describe what kind of words does he use to describe what the second coming of christ is going to be like so as a thief in the night okay so notice that as a th as a thief in the night something that's very sudden okay unexpected okay at that point when he comes what's society going to be like what are people going to be saying at that point in time in society peace and safety everybody's going to be peace and safety and at that at that point he's going to suddenly come the dead in christ will rise first okay so we have that there okay so the dead in christ will rise and those who are still alive what will happen yeah they'll be caught up won't it so that will be left we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the to meet the lord in the air and then he talks about the trumpet of god um i think there was also i maybe cut something out here accidentally about the archangel as well and so we see, these, we see these truths, and the bodies of the dead believers will rise first, going to heaven, where they will be re reunited with their spirit and their soul. And what will happen at that point for the unbeliever? There's also, there's also for the believer and also the unbeliever. How is the unbeliever um, uh, marked here in these particular verses? Yeah, destruction will come suddenly. Okay, so notice that. And they will not escape. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a declaration for the unbeliever as well. So let's dig in this. What is the connection between the believer and Enoch? Yeah, we're going to walk from one life to another without dying. Potentially, if we're still alive, when Christ comes back, we'll meet him, meet him in the air. What do you think that's going to be like? Can you imagine? <sighs> to dwell with him, to meet him in the air, to go into his embrace. Like, can you imagine? Is that not a reality? Is that not a promise for us as believers in Jesus Christ? Notice this passage again. Let me just read it one more time. And there's something more we want to bring out. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night while people are saying peace and safety destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape so what are the illustrations that god uses to show how christ will come back what illustrations is he used to, to, to mark how he will return he will come as a, a thief in the night we don't know when the thief is going to come do we if we did we would set a guard what's the other illustration like labor pains on, on, a, on a pregnant woman. This is to help us to understand that we do not know the day or the hour when Christ will return. In fact, in Matthew 24, 36, Jesus stated that no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, or for, uh, but only the Father. Christ's second coming will be sudden, surprising, when, it, when it's least expected. At that point, the tranquility of the unbeliever will suddenly end as God begins to judge them, and it won't be pretty. 
Their end will be the lake of fire. Incredible. So why would God tell us as believers, notice what it says here, therefore encourage each other with these words. Why are we as believers in Jesus Christ supposed to be encouraging each other with this truth? There's no fear in death. There's only, there's only life with God forever and forever thereafter, isn't there? You see, all the wrath for our sin was poured out on Christ. There is no judgment or wrath to come. And so we as believers, there's no fear in death because Christ has dealt with all of it on the cross. He said it is finished, and we need to understand that. So all this talk about Christ coming as a thief in the night and believers be taken up in heaven, it can be kind of overwhelming. And you know, there's some people that even scoff at the impossibility and saying it's impossible, but who are they scoffing at? Yes, God. And who's God? The one who spoke the worlds into being. He is the one who said, I am coming again. Who are they scoffing at? Is that, is, that a, is that a safe proposition for them to be doing? God did. And he's the one that says coming again. And who is Christ? He's the one who died and rose again, did he not? And he's the one that said he's coming again. And he's the one who never lies. He's always faithful. If we've learned anything from God's word is this. When he declares something, he does it all. He does it exactly as he's declared. Isn't this, the, isn't this declaration of his return? Think about this. Here's, a, here's Adam and Eve at the point of their sin. God made an incredible declaration. A deliverer is coming. And so as believers in Jesus Christ, we also stand at that same, that same point where God has said, I am coming. And the one who made that declaration and came is the same one who's making the declaration that he will return. Proof positive, and we need to look at it through that particular lens. Before we leave Enoch, there's one more point. Don't miss out on our present walk with Christ because we can become so focused on dissecting what that second coming is and what it's going to be like that we lose focus as to our relationship with Christ. It's like this illustration. Think of a person who is single whose sole focus is on getting married. Marriage becomes everything that they miss out on all the relationships and the joy in the present. You see, the reality is the relationship makes a good marriage, not the ring. The same is true for the believer. They can become so focused on Christ's second coming that they miss out on the joy of Christ's relationship in the present. Heaven isn't the defining moment of our rescue, but rather being born again into our relationship with Christ. And we need to focus on that. Let's be like Enoch, where we so enjoy walking with God that we have the strength to face everything in this life. Death is not to be feared because it's a continuation of our walk from this life into the next. Let's focus on Christ. He said he's coming. Let's be like Enoch and walk with him in uh, anticipation he's going to do it. Okay, so let's apply this. What is the next greatest event that's to happen on this earth? Yes, yeah, Jesus coming again, isn't it? What's holding him back? Yeah, it's not time yet, is it? He's, it says not time yet, but what's holding him back? Is there anything to hold him back other than his declaration? He has grace. It's his grace to a lost world, giving them opportunity to repent. But the reality is, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to live in the reality that he is coming again. He's declared it, and we need to understand it, and he's the one that made that declaration. He's going to come. We just don't know when it's going to be. In that instant, every believer will be ushered into the presence of God, and we're going to dwell with Christ forever. Won't that be incredible? And so we as believers need to take our eyes off of the things of this world and to, and to look up. Now let's take a moment to process on something here. This was astounding as I began thinking about it. We need to take a moment to, to look at Christ's second coming through the lens of his first coming. Because there's a connection. As he declared he was going to come again, he also declared he's going to come the first time. Let's make, let's make these connections. Christ's second coming is the plan and purpose of God as his first coming. Think about that. All through Bible 101, we've been talking about the deliverer's coming, the deliverer's coming, the deliverer's coming. So think about that. The Christ is coming. The Christ is coming. Christ is coming. We also need to look at that in light of the declaration of his first coming. And that's his God, it's God's purposes and his plan. God, Christ's second coming was declared by God as was his first coming. Christ's second coming is necessary as his first coming. God had to intervene. The first time, he had to intervene to save us from our sin. The second time is to intervene to save us from this sin-cursed world. God is stepping in. Christ's second coming is as guaranteed as his first coming. Nothing or no one can stop him. Think about it. How many times did Satan and evil rulers try to stop their, from Christ from coming? How many roadblocks were put there all the way through? Were they successful? 
Absolutely not. And so too, his second coming, there's nothing or no one that can hinder him. His purpose and his plans will be accomplished. Only God knows when Christ will return the second time, as was his first coming. No one else. And so think about this as a believer in Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, here's Adam when he heard Christ's promise of his first coming, a deliverer's coming. Adam had no idea of the how or the what. But think about this. Here as believers in Jesus Christ, this is where we stand, just like Adam. Christ has promised to come again. We don't know the how and the what of all of it, but he said he's coming. And God wants us as believers to live in anticipation that he is coming and to be ready as to what he has in store for us. So how do we know that we can believe Christ that he's coming again? He said so. How else can we know it? As he was true to his first promise, he'd be true to his second one, won't he? Amen. He is coming. The question is, will we believe God that Christ is coming again? We don't know the day or the hour, but he is coming. Sadly, there's so many, there are many so-called prophets making predictions about the end of the world. It will happen on this date, or it's going to be this sign. So how do we know that these are not of God? He said no one knew. He's going to come as a, a thief in the night. These men are false prophets who set themselves up to be greater than Christ. Christ said no one knows the day or the hour, but these prophets do. Isn't that awful audacious on their part? And in the Old Testament, a true prophet was identified by how accurate it was. And if his prophecies didn't come true, what happened to him? He was to be stoned. So what's going to happen to these false prophets today for all the, all the predictions that they're making? Who, who are they going to stand before? I wouldn't want to be in their shoes, would you? All of this challenge is to ask, should we as believers be frightened about Christ's return? Is there anything to fear? Absolutely not, because we're going home, isn't it? When he comes, we're going home to our eternal home. There's nothing to fear, nothing to fear at all. But on the other hand, those who refuse to humble themselves yet of their sin, what have they got to fear? If Christ was to come back at this instant, where does it take them? What happens to them? Their judgment begins, doesn't it? God has only given the unbeliever this life to make, to make things right with God, to stand before him. They need not delay, but to repent and put their faith in the finished work of Christ now. Now is the day of salvation. Christ will return to claim his children as pictured in the life of Enoch. Incredible? In conclusion, I trust that God has astounded us, um, astou- um, astounded us in how our lives can reflect our true destiny. This carries incredible potential for our lives, doesn't it? As we begin to soak up the truths of our win, that our future is secure, does that not just give us incredible hope? Does that put a spring in our step as we go forward? In Christ, every believer wins, assured of heaven, in, uh, excuse me, assured of acceptance by God in the sin-cursed world, assured of heaven, and, um, and also of God judging all sin. Christ will return as pictured in Enoch. Let me share one final illustration with you about the assurance a believer has in Christ. And from this illustration, I'm going to take a song that's, that goes like this. I've read the back of the book and we win. The song goes like this. I've been reading in the Bible about the ending of the age, and one thing that's for certain, it grows closer every day. But I am not concerned about the way it's going to end, because I've read the back of the book and we win. Here's the chorus. I read the back of the book and we win. No more living in darkness. We'll be living at home with him. You see, there's no need to worry about it if you've been born again. I've read the back of the book and we win. The reality is if we have believers in Jesus Christ, if we take, go to the back of the book and we understand, we read the back of the book, we win. Because we've read the back of the book as well. God declares with absolute certainty that we win. This is God's promise to every believer. We can go forward in confidence, not worrying about what will happen until the last page is complete. As a result, we can go forward with a song on our lips. I've read the back of the book, and we win. Amen? The the Mangan people actually wrote it. Mangan believers wrote a song. um, Jesus emi winner man is the winner man. Satan emi loser man is the loser man. And and so they just began living in this reality that they've won in Christ. And so we as believers in Jesus Christ, we're on the winning side and we win. Not because of us, but because of Christ.